and not huge, it's still just 40 feet. Oh. <laughs> I realized I was like, oh, okay. make sure I make sure I mention that. All right, so no, 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 still, I think it's like 45 still. All right, so we're going to start, we're going to take plants from the very beginning of plants to where we are now and how they're so successful. But the very first plants were not fancy like what we have out here. The very first plants had to learn how to live on land. Because what were the most recent common ancestors to these plants? Yes. yes. Very good. Last class they were like, um, bacteria? Uh, cyan? Yes, algae, our protists. And they're the ones who led to our photosynthetic autotrophs that live on land, our vascular plants. But all algae are located where? In the, water. in the water. And we talked about the fact that these algae can be really, really, really big in water, but as soon as you put them on land, they collapse. And they're just this big pile of seaweed. So, in order for plants to move on to land, they had to randomly mutate. Those mutations had to be beneficial so that those mutations, beneficial mutations turned into adaptations and those adaptations led to evolution. So remember when we talked about evolution, it goes to mutation, then it becomes an adaptation, and then it leads to evolution, because that takes millions of years. The very first plants lived right next to water. Why? When they lived in water, just like we looked at animals, and we will look at animals, the very first, they're in water, and then they have to learn to live on land. They still have to live close to water because they depend on it for a variety of reasons. In this case, plants, the very first plants needed water to have babies. Nobody thinks about our plants sexually reproducing, but our very first plants would release sperm into the water, and they would swim upstream to another plant and fertilize it. We don't do that anymore, but those plants still are successful living near water. Where do our plant sperm get released to now? Because they don't live in the water. In the air. Most of our plant sperm is released in the air. Or how about those stickers that stick to you? Those are those are plants from the seeds. So they've adap adapted. They've adapted various ways of reproducing that have been successful for them. So we're going to look at their transition. The very first plants living right next to water and slowly moving away from water. So in the plant kingdom. We have around 300,000 species of plants, and you'll be quite surprised at which one we have the most of, but we'll get there. They can be divided into 10 phyla. In order to be a plant, you have to be a primary producer. Hmm. What does that mean? Yes, sir. They produce, they, they release oxygen. They're autotrophic, they're photosynthetic. But why does it say primary producer? Because normally when you say primary, what follows? Secondary. So what does that lead us to believe? Plants are primary producers, but there are some that might have another mode of nutrition. Like the Venus flytrap. It's photosynthetic, but it's also heterotrophic. So primary tells you that for the most part they should be photosynthetic. I mean, they are photosynthetic, but there are some that have secondary means of gaining nutrition. Okay? In order for plants to live on land, these are the four things that had to evolve so that they could survive away from water. So they were in water as algae and how they got out of water. The very first thing is they had to avoid desiccation. What's desiccation? Dehydrating, drying out. So when you take algae out of the water and you put it on the beach and it sits there for an hour, it's dead. It can't, it can't survive. Physical support. <clears throat> you have to literally be able to support that plant. Again, the algae was supported by water, but could it support itself? So we have to adapt structures that allow for physical support, nutrient uptake. It has to be able to take in water and minerals because it's not in water anymore. Plants that lived in water didn't have to worry about the 
bringing in water because they were in water. Versus these plants that are trying to live away from water had to figure out a way to get water to them. So that's what it means by nutrient uptake, and it's truly telling you the direction uptake because water travels which direction in a plant? Up. Okay, so water will bring the minerals with it. Then plants also had to be able to reproduce without using water. And you and I know that that's possible because that's how all our plants reproduce now. But these are the four things that had to evolve in order for these plants to be successful outside of the water. <clears throat> plants and green algae share these common characteristics. But green algae are not... They're not plants. They are protists. They have cellulose in their cell walls. Having cellulose in your cell walls, remember, not your cell walls, but that's a carbohydrate that we use as an indicator that we're dealing with a plant. They have photosynthetic starch. You know what photosynthetic means, but what's starch? It's a carbohydrate. And it's only made in plants. So when you hear starch, that is indicating to you directly that you're dealing with something plant. When plants store energy, they do it in the form of starch. Does anybody remember how you and I store energy? It starts with a G. A group of glucose is glycogen. Glucagon is the, what will break it down. Yeah. Yeah. You're good, you're good. Then both of them have chlorophylls A and B. And what do you know about chlorophyll A and B? They're green, and they're the photosynthetic pigments. Okay, so they allow for the absorption of green uh, waves of light, green wavelengths of light. Here it says, and just like you mentioned a moment ago, plants evolved from a green algae, specifically the charophytes. It says 425 to 490 million years ago. Real quick. Does anybody remember how long ago fungi evolved? It was 500 million years ago. So literally we're studying these in the progression that they showed up. Starting this semester, we discussed, or that's where we started this semester, was the origins of the earth. How it was just rock and storms and water, and we talked about all that. And I told you that over time, they have found evidence that biomolecules were formed. There was no life, but biomolecules were formed. So like carbohydrates, amino acids, and lipids. And when you took these lipids and you put them on the rock, they did nothing. But if you took them and put them in water, the phospholipids would form a bilayer. So we went from nothing, rocks, water, and weather, to biomolecules, still not alive, but once we put those biomolecules in water, they formed a phospholipid bilayer, which is like our vesicle, which is what we called the protocell. The protocell eventually gave rise to the first prokaryote, which was anaerobic. Why? There was no oxygen in the atmosphere. So would that have been a regular bacteria or an archaeobacteria? An archaeobacteria. They could withstand really harsh conditions. And in fact, it was using sulfur as its source for food. Then we had a random mutation. And this mutation allowed for them to become aerobic. Well, they would be photosynthetic, but they, they were releasing oxygen. And slowly oxygen would build up in the atmosphere. And we went from archaeobacteria to now eubacteria, regular bacteria. Then we went to protist, which is everything outcast. And then from protist, each that's eukaryotes, were our first group of eukaryotes. Protists, there was a group that led to fungi that we studied for the last test. There was a group that led to plants, and there will be a group that leads to animals, which will be the last thing we study. So we study archaeobacteria, bacteria, protists, and fungi. We're doing plants now, and then we'll do animals last, and then it will be done with this class. But we've literally studied them in their evolutionary progression. Okay? So different types of plants, mosses are going to be bryophytes, which are our very first plants, and we'll discuss that shortly. Oops. And then we have the orchids, which are our angiosperms, and then a ponderosa pine. 
This is a gymnosperm, and these are not randomly put here. This is intentional. Pine trees reproduce using pine cones. Does anybody know what will happen if you plant a pine cone? Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, it does. Pine cones need fire to be activated. These are very primitive, but the you plant a pine cone, and I did this when I was like, tried to grow my own Christmas trees. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> but you can plant it and it will do nothing because they've evolved to be ignited. And once they're ignited, the pine cone will split open and the seeds are within the core. But why... If a pine tree produces pine cones and they drop to the ground, they're doing nothing. So why? Like it's reproducing, but there's no babies. What are pine forests prone to do? Catch fire. And they burn very quickly. So instead of, so they drop their babies, and within those pine cones, they can literally live 30 years. That pine forest catches on fire, burns, activates those cones, and you have the germination of your next generation of plants. But also, if you're a parent plant and your pine cones drop right here, what's the problem? You're going to pee, and the parent plant's going to win. So even though the whole fire thing is really cool, this is a really unsuccessful type of plant because there's only 700 species on Earth because of the way they reproduce. Yeah, we burn. Yeah, so we are not starting forest fires. Christina, what a horrible idea! But these guys here, this group. So these are called gymnosperms, and we'll get there. This group right here is called angiosperms. And angiosperms are super successful. Super successful. Why are they so successful? They don't need fire to have babies. That's true. They don't need sunlight for babies. Uh, these guys specialize in attracting help for having babies. Flowers. Flowers make a plant attractive. And guess where the sperm to that plant is? Inside the flower. And fruits. Fruits are ovaries. <laughs> so as you ate your apple, just know that you're munching on an ovary. And that plant is using you to have babies. I hope you feel violated. <laughs> 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 News report. You need to have sex with a plant. <laughs> let's, not, let's not say that. <laughs> um, but but um, perhaps you enabled it to reproduce. Let's say that. Don't delete that. I just get it. Don't delete that, Osama. I can just see that going back. <laughs> um, here is a stonewort, which is our very a first form of a plant, which we'll end up calling a bryophyte. But it looks big here, but this is actually a really, really tiny plant, and it's pretty dependent on living near water. It does not have vascular tissue, so it requires water to be super, super close so that it can reproduce. Now, for plants to live on land, two major adaptations came about to begin with. We're going to kind of stay on these for a moment. The first is a cuticle. You and I produce keratin. It's a protein that water produces, which is why we can be in the shower and we don't absorb all this water, but it's also why when we take in a bunch of water, we don't just lose it immediately. We're waterproof. Plants, well, let me go back one step. Green algae aren't protected from desiccation. They're not waterproof. So the only way they get water is if it comes through them, like they get, it 
goes through them, and they can lose water just as fast as they get it. When these algae grew closer to the edge of water, they had to be able to keep in water, or they couldn't leave the water. Did they say, oh, I just pray for protection? No. There was just a random mutation that turned out to be beneficial, and as a result became an adaptation, which eventually led to evolution. Very good. So they slowly started having these cuticle type structures that would allow for that plant to take in water and not lose it. But the flip side of that is, when you water a plant's leaves, does it take in water? No, it's waterproof. So like when you're watering the grass and you're like, or you're watering the tree leaves, you're doing nothing. You look fun. Like, oh, like you're doing some service to these plants. But the only place that they can absorb water is the roots. So if you really want to make a friend with that plant, you take that watering hose, you just place it at the base of the plant, walk away. You shall, from this point forward in your life, see your neighbors watering the rose bushes doing this to the brick wall and thinking that they're just watering those leaves away. You're doing nothing. Logan, you drop it, then. Oh, you can't if you don't want to. Logan, do you just specialize in plant culture, or what do you do? Okay, so cuticle, first thing. Um, okay. Let's stop with your awkwardness. The second thing, besides having a cuticle, is having a way to respire, to exchange gas carbon dioxide, and oxygen. Plants produce, ox plants, plants produce oxygen, but they utilize carbon dioxide. So if they have this cuticle on them, there has to be a way for carbon dioxide to get in and oxygen to get out. So they create it, or they mutate it, to create these small pores that open and close that are called stomata. These stomata, and I'll have a picture here in a moment, these stomata, for the most part, are located on the underside of a leaf. Why on the underside? Why? How? You're right. It allows for less water to escape. But how? The sun hits the top of the leaf, and it heats it up. And so water, through the process of transpiration, which we're going to study, immediately begins to ascend. Because when you heat up water, it begins to rise. That's what vapors do. So it comes to the top. Now, if those pores were at the top, that water would continue its way into the atmosphere. But because they're at the bottom, it tends to condense on the bottom of that leaf, and a lot of times it will drop right back down. Now, does it always? The answer is no. But it gives a chance, it gives the plant a chance to try to reclaim some of that water. Our plants here in Texas, though, are one of a kind, as almost everything is. Because it gets so hot here in the summer, they keep their pores closed. But that's not healthy. Because they're producing a lot of oxygen, and they have no more carbon dioxide. So they will stay closed during the day. And then guess what they do at night? Open, and they release tons of uh, oxygen and take in tons of carbon dioxide. And then as soon as the sun begins to hit them in the morning, they close. Plants, and we're going to study, you're going to know plants at a different level. Oh. But they have hormones. I'm sure you do, Logan. I don't want to hear it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. They have hormones. They don't like to be touched. They respond in stressful situations. Plants are a whole, I mean, they're a living organism, but it's a whole different thing, a whole different world when you talk about how they react with their environment or interact with their environment. So, when we get to land plants, okay, which are going to be where we're, this whole unit is about, we have two major groups, bryophytes and tracheophytes. Bryophytes are considered non-vascular plants. Tracheophytes are vascular plants. 
I'm just going to ask for the common sense card, but what do you think the difference is? Yeah, one of them is vascular and one of them is non-vascular. So this actually gives you quite a bit of information because the non-vascular plants, they have no vessels like you and I do, so they can only be super small. And because they're super small, they have to live near water. So bryophytes are going to be our mosses, our liverworts, our hornworts, things that have to live near water because they still rely on the water to reproduce and they have no vessels to support them. So there's no way of getting water from the bottom of the plant top. They have to be in water. Tracheophytes, on the other hand, are like every plant you see out here. They have two vessels, which we're going to name today, xylem and phloem, which allow them to pull water from the soil and transport it up the plant. And then phloem will allow for the sugars that the plant makes to be transported down to the roots. There's a couple of terms for tracheophytes. Again, these are all the plants that we have or that you're familiar with. They have specialized transport cells. Lignin. Lignin is another carbohydrate. We already said cellulose, but these have lignin. This is a secondary support structure. So these cells are highly reinforced. <clears throat> another term that we're introducing right here, meristem. If you're in anatomy with me, when we talk about humans, we have stem cells. And stem cells are a type of cell that can become anything. Mary stem are plant stem cells. So when it says Mary stomatic tissue or Mary stem, these are plant stem cells. Mary stem is plant stem cells. Here it's mentioning two types of Mary stem. And I'm going to ask you again to use your common sense slash logical processing skills. We have apical married stem and lateral married stem. Based on those two terms, is there one that kind of speaks to you as far as where it may be located? Where would lateral married stem be uh, located? On the sides. Lateral married stem are stem cells that allow the plant to grow this way. Lateral married stem allows the plant to grow this way. In girth or in width. So if lateral allows it to grow this way, in girth or width, what do you think apical allows it to do? Very good. Grow up, or and I'm going down as well because roots grow down. Apical tells you that it's found at the very tips of the shoots, so the part above the ground, or the roots, the part below the ground. Okay. So lateral mary stem or stem cells located on the sides of that plant so that it can grow out. And apical are at the very top and the bottom of that plant so it can grow up. Okay? Another term. Embryophyte. Embryophyte. Does anybody, I think we know what embryo means. What does embryo mean real quick? An embryo. It's a baby, so we had zygote, then it's an embryo for about eight weeks in human life, in plants it's a different time, but then it becomes a fetus, okay? Embryo is an early on development, but it says embryo fight. Do you recall what fight means? Or what it gives us an association to? We do use it a lot, but when does it come into play? Like, you'll notice... When you use it, you're specifically talking about a certain thing. Plants. <laughs> so when you say sporophyte, gametophyte, we're talking about plants. Whenever we're talking about our gametes, we call them zoans, spermozoans, or oogonia. Like we use a different term. Like phyte tells you we're dealing with plants. So embryophyte tells you that I'm dealing with a baby plant. I'm dealing with a baby plant. Okay, here are the two adaptations um, to land. The first is this layer of wax. 
this cuticle. So you have your cells here, but then we have this waxy cuticle, which allows for water to stay in the plant, but it also keeps water out of the plant. So if water hits that waxy cuticle, it just beads up and rolls off. Here are the stomata. As part of your lab, you're going to take a razor blade and cut a leaf, the very bottom of it, because that's where the stomata are going to be located, and you're going to put it on the slide. You're literally going to see that there are hundreds of stomata at the very bottom of every leaf that allow for this gas exchange to occur, occur. Because these will be clippings taken from trees or plants in this area. These, will th these are things that you would see on your properties as well. Okay, so those, these pores will open and close in response to um, the amount of light or heat. And it allows for carbon dioxide and oxygen to be exchanged. The vascular tissue, which is a, obviously another land adaptation, allows for these plants to be taller than 100 meters and more complex than bryophytes. Once again, bryophytes are the non-vascular plant. So these are our mosses that we find really close to the water. Okay, Bryophytes lack true roots and stems. So they are just super, super tiny and they live where water is very accessible to them. The type of vascular tissue, there are two types, xylem and phloem. I know that I am simple-minded, but I can memorize really well. This is how I remember the difference between the two. I say xylem transports water up, and I remember that all of these letters are close together in the alphabet. <laughs> phloem transports food down. So I remember that these phonetically sound the same. So phloem and food, and then xylem water up. So phloem food down. Water comes in a plant through the roots, and the xylem will take it from the roots to the very top of the plant. Plants make food in their leaves, so those, that food needs to be traveling from the leaves to the roots. So xylem transports water up, and phloem transports food down. Those are the only two vessels. You and I have arteries and veins, plants have xylem and phloem. This um, is a fossil of a plant. This is not the actual plant of an early vascular plant. So as it was coming outside of the water, this looks very big, but in actuality, it's very small. Okay, root systems. When you hear roots, this means anything in a plant that is underground, okay? There will be a section in here where we talk, not in this section, but a section within plants where we talk about root modifications. Because like mangroves, there's no oxygen in the water, so their roots have to grow up out of the water. We'll get there. So roots mean anything underground. Roots are anything underground. They serve two purposes. Anchor plants and to absorb water and nutrients. Anchor plants and absorb water and nutrients. Two purposes or two, um, the two jobs of roots. Rhizomes are horizontal roots or technically it's a stem, but it's modified. And in Texas, if you've ever pulled weeds, if you haven't, then you're very fortunate. And if you've ever had to be in the garden and pull weeds, we have here, when you pull one weed, sometimes there's like a line and it's connected to another one. So you pull one and it comes up and, it, and then you pull it and it's like literally a rope of weeds. Our plants do that. We are so fortunate in Texas. Let me explain what happens. You have one that it's supposed to be a weed, but not the illegal type. It's like a weed growing from the ground. Okay? We call weeds invasive because when they come in, they take all the resources from the healthy plants or organisms that are living around them. But what happens is when this because there's other grasses growing here, like good grasses, and when it's absorbed or taken as much as it can, 
it either has to find a way out, and it can't walk, or it has to spread. So it will shoot a horizontal stem, and then whenever that stem touches the ground, another plant, weed plant, Like, you know what I'm talking about, not bad stuff. Anyways, it shoots these horizontal stems or modified roots out. I know you can't see that, but so that's what happens. When you're pulling one and it's connected to another one and you just have this like five foot long, look, I just pull a whole leaf out of the park. They're all connected. That horizontal root is a modified stem. And it allows for that, that plant to continue to move. Root systems are always underground. I don't want to say always, let me rephrase that. Generally speaking, underground, there are modifications that we will discuss. And they're there to absorb water and nutrients from the environment. They're there to absorb water and nutrients from the environment. A shoot system. A shoot system is anything above ground. Anything above ground. Is that my phone? You said what? I don't know. I don't know what I did. I didn't even touch her. Anyway, the stems and leaves are all part of the shoot system. Leaves evolved. Our first plants didn't have leaves. But leaves, as they began to evolve, what do you think they were adapting to? Changes in the So let's look at what some of these shoot systems used to look like. Early plants, and we even see these in mosses. Then we had this branching pattern, and this branching pattern was a random mutation that became beneficial, so it resulted in an adaptation which eventually led to evolution to where we now have leaves that are flat and thin as opposed to very few like conifers, like pine needles. Those are round, straight leaves, but they're not as good at carrying out photosynthesis. Why a flat leaf? What is it able to do more? Absorb more sunlight. And it's thinner, so we can get more cells there and more access to those chloroplasts. We're going to study all that. Okay, now the last thing I want to point out here. As far as how plants have babies, sporophyte, gametophyte, the fact it says phyte tells you what? Plants. Sporophytes are diploids. Gametophyte are haploids. This is taking me back to our flowering plants versus our pines, our gymnosperms. The plants that you and I see today, for the most part, are diploids, which means that they're a result of sexual reproduction. Why are sexually reproduced plants so successful? Variation, that's it, 100%, that's it, variation. Because they're a result of sexual reproduction, there's so many different variations that if one doesn't survive, it's fine because another one can take over. We don't see the same thing in conifers or pines. So early plants and less successful plants, say haploid, and tend to asexually reproduce versus the flowering plants, which are extremely successful, that sexually reproduce. Gametophytes are haploids, sporophytes are diploids. Okay? That's where we're going to stop today. What questions do you have, if any? I'm excited about plants.